phase diagram is going to be the topic of this lesson, and we're going to identify the lines of equilibrium, the triple point, the critical point, solid liquid gas phases, everything you need to know about a phase diagram. And then we'll talk about two special compounds, which are a little unique from normal CO2 and water. My name is Chad and welcome to Chad's Prep, where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. And in addition to high school and college science prep, we also do MCAT, DAT, and OAT prep as well. You can find those courses at chadsprep.com. Now this lesson's part of my new general chemistry playlist. I'm releasing several lessons a week throughout the entire school year. So if you wanna be notified every time I post a new one, subscribe to the channel, click the bell notification. All right, so we're gonna start with a very typical compound. We'll start with a phase diagram for what a uh, typical compound looks like here. And so a phase diagram is going to be a, a plot of pressure versus temperature where we see the three different phases, solid, liquid, gas. And if you look even on like CO2 and water versus solid, liquid, gas, they always fall in the same places. And you kind of find a, you know, follow a typical line here as you increase temperature going left to right here, you go from solid to liquid to gaseous phase. So that's kind of what's going on. And uh, the lines on the curves here are called the lines of equilibrium, and uh, the reason they're called that is because that's where you have two phases in equilibrium. So if you're over here somewhere, you definitely have a solid, and if you're over here somewhere, you definitely have a liquid, but if you're right on that line, anywhere along that line, you have a solid and a liquid in equilibrium together, hence the name lines of equilibrium. And so here you'd have the liquid and gas in equilibrium together, and then here the solid and the gas in equilibrium together. And then you have one very special point right here where all three lines of equilibrium meet, and we call that the triple point. So because that's where all three phases are in equilibrium together, and that's what you should definitely know about the triple point. Cool, you should be able to identify phase changes on here. And again, all, all six of those phase changes are ones you learned back in the day. And, uh, you might recall we talked about going from solid to liquid, and that's fusion, but going the opposite, liquid back to solid, crystallization or freezing. Cool, and then between liquid and gas, if you go from liquid to gas, that's vaporization. If I can spell correctly, not very well. So, and then gas back to liquid condensation. So, and then finally, between solid and gas, the one students are most likely to forget. So going from solid to gas, that's sublimation. And then from gas back to solid, don't forget to deposit that in your head that it's called deposition. Cool. And so sometimes you get a question that just gives you a phase diagram and they give you one of these six arrows and say, you know, identify which phase change that corresponds to. Cool. Now we got one other special point out on this curve, and that's right here at the end of this liquid gas line of equilibrium. So, and we call this the critical point. We alluded to this in the last lesson, at least a little bit. So, and it corresponds to a critical pressure and a critical temperature. So, and it turns out this point is defined as the point beyond which there are no uh, liquid gas phase transitions. So, if you look, when you go from, you know, solid phase here and you cross again over to the liquid phase, you're going through fusion, i.e. melting, and you, you go through a phase transition. Now with the liquid gas, there's some pretty noticeable phase transitions going on. So if we consider condensation here, so if I took, uh, you know, a gas at a point and let's say we just pick and let's do this in green to distinguish everything going on here. So let's say I just take a gas at a point like this point right here, and I just jack up the pressure. Well. When I jack up the pressure here, as soon as I cross that line of equilibrium, it turns into a liquid and all of a sudden we'd have this gas that spread out and it would condense into a liquid. Now we could do the same thing if we just lowered the temperature instead. And again, if all we did was lower the temperature, as soon as we crossed that line, it would turn into a liquid. And again, so it would condense. And so it used to be a professor that would take a 55 gallon drum and he would fill it full of superheated steam, seal off the top and throw it in the corner before students would get to class. So, and then as students would, you know, file in and get to class and stuff like that, he'd just start lecturing like normal. And well, the whole time the temperature is dropping on that superheated steam in that 55 gallon drum. And as soon as it would drop below a hundred degrees Celsius, so in an instant, it would go undergo a phase transition condensing into a liquid. And as a result, there wasn't as much gas on the inside putting pressure on the inside walls as there is still gas and air on the outside putting pressure on the outside walls. And the whole thing would implode, making a crazy loud sound that would scare the crap out of everybody. So in previous videos, this is normally where I'd scare you by going boom, but uh, I'm letting you off the hook this time. So 
Uh, but it's a great demo. So, but the idea is that you get this really, really sudden phase transition. Well, you know, one thing you could do with this same gas here is instead, you know, if you want to end up at either one of these points right here, instead of going directly there by either raising the pressure or lowering the temperature, you could take this gas and raise the temperature. Then you could raise the pressure. Then you could lower the temperature. So, and then you could lower the pressure back down and you're going to end up right back at this same point in a roundabout fashion. The problem is that you never actually go through a phase transition. There's not just like an instant where you realize, oh, I just turned from a gas to a liquid. So, and again, if in this case, jacking up the pressure, right as soon as we cross that line, it would be very noticeable that the gas turned into a liquid. But here, as we raise the temperature, the molecules are gonna move faster and faster and faster. So, and then as you raise the pressure, we're gonna start forcing them closer and closer and closer together. So, under normal conditions, below the critical uh, point there, so as you jack up the pressure, what you're gonna find happening is that at some point, the molecules are gonna become close enough together that their attractive forces win, and they're just gonna attract each other into uh, condensing into the liquid phase. Well, the, the key here is that when you're above the critical temperature, your molecules have so much kinetic energy that it turns out for this particular substance, whatever it is, it doesn't matter how close you put them together, how high you jack up that pressure, they're always gonna have more kinetic energy, more than enough to prevent them from condensing, to overcome those attractive forces. And so it turns out, you know, we alluded to this in the last lesson that the greater the intermolecular attractive forces present in a substance, the higher this critical point is going to be, both in terms of higher critical temperature and higher critical pressure. And so I wanted to allude to that now. So, but again, we can go all the way around the horn here. So jacking up the temperature, jacking up the pressure, lowering that temperature, and then lowering the pressure, end up at exactly that same point. But there's no clear point where you're like, oh, that's where it just turned into a liquid. So it turns out at some point it did become a liquid, <laughs> and typically we'd you know, have to identify that not because it was noticeable, but just because at some point when it drops below this critical point, we'd now call it a liquid and things of this sort. So also it turns out when you're up in this region up here, we refer to this as a super critical fluid. So when you're above the critical point, you're not a liquid or a gas, you're, we just refer to it therefore as a super critical fluid. Cool, so this is your typical phase diagram. Most substances all look like this. So one other thing we gotta identify is where one atmosphere lies, and one atmosphere might lie, say, right here. And so if we drag a line across here, well, right here on that line of equilibrium between solid and liquid, at one atmosphere, that would be called the normal melting point. So normal just refers to the fact that it's occurring at one atmosphere, again, atmospheric pressure at sea level. And then if you drag that further along, my diagram's starting to get a little messier than I intended. So, but that point on the line of equilibrium between liquid and gas at one atmosphere would be called the normal boiling point. And so those are the other two points you might be on the hook for identifying on a typical phase diagram. Now what's gonna make carbon dioxide unique is just where one atmosphere lies. And for carbon dioxide, that one atmosphere actually lies below the triple point, and that's unusual. So notice here that one atmosphere is above that triple point in terms of pressure, but for carbon dioxide, it's below. And as a result, if you heat up carbon dioxide, solid carbon dioxide, AKA dry ice, well, in this case, as you heat it up, it's going to sublime, not melt. It never turns into liquid carbon dioxide. So because that liquid carbon dioxide never exists at one atmosphere, it only exists at higher pressures than that. So again, anything higher than that triple point potentially has a chance to exist. So, but down here, it's not gonna happen. So dry ice, they call it dry ice because it goes straight from solid to gas. It never turns into a liquid at one atmosphere. And so it never feels wet, hence the name. And so that's what you should know is unique about carbon dioxide, a, AKA dry ice, is that it sublimes at atmospheric pressure. So water has its own uniqueness as well, and definitely something you didn't need to know. Now, if we look at where one atmosphere is, that's not what is gonna tell you what is unique about water. It's still above the triple point, just like a typical substance. What's gonna be different about water though, is that solid liquid line of equilibrium. So in a typical compound, that's gonna have an uphill slope, a positive slope. Carbon dioxide, still a positive slope, but for water, it actually has a downhill slope. So a negative slope. 
So, and that is rather unusual and it's actually rather special, but actually rather important as well. So it turns out that without that negative slope, you probably wouldn't be alive today or ever have been alive, <laughs> might be the case in things of this sort. So it has super important implications for like life on earth and the development of life and things of this sort. And so, uh, but it turns out that this is a function, look, look at a couple different ways, but a function of the fact that, uh, you know, when ice, uh, when water freezes to ice, it actually expands. That is unusual for most substances. When they freeze, they actually get more condensed, more dense, uh, as the case may be. But for water, that's backwards. It turns out due to hydrogen bonding, we learned about that in the last lesson. So to form that lovely crystal lattice uh, that ice forms, it actually expands a little bit to maximize the amount of hydrogen bonding going on. And so due to hydrogen bonding, ice is actually less dense than liquid water. So, and as a result, uh, that's what actually is gonna be the cause of this negative slope. And so this is important for a couple reasons. So. Uh, if you look at the way, say, like a lake or a river or even the oceans freeze in the winter, well, when the when water starts to freeze, it floats to the surface. And so it freezes from the top down. And so that's important because when you freeze it on the top, it actually insulates what's below it from that cold weather and it might not freeze all the way through. And so that's important. So otherwise, every winter, the oceans would freeze all the way through and most of the fish and life would not survive and that's kind of a problem. If all the life dies every year, then what's going to get it started again the next year and, and things of this sort. So kind of important for life on Earth that water has this property. So also important for your ice hockey players. So your ice hockey players uh, take advantage of this all the time. So it turns out when you have ice, let's say, let's say right around here, and you got some ice. So, well, underneath that ice hockey player skate is going to be generated a very high pressure. You might recall that pressure equals force per unit area. And so his weight provides a force, and then it's over a very narrow blade, so a small surface area. And so it actually generates a rather high pressure. And so right underneath the blade of that skate, the pressure goes up. So, and you cross that line of uh, that line of equilibrium. And so the solid ice turns into liquid water. So, and this is important because it turns out that slippery ice that's a little bit wet is, you know, more slippery <laughs> uh, than, than ice that's not a little bit wet. And so the, the coefficient of, of friction goes down. And so uh, you can skate a whole lot faster on ice that's a little bit wet than just on ice that's not a little bit wet. And so as a result, ice hockey players can skate faster and things of this sort. So, I thought it'd be funny if we just, uh, you know, took an ice hockey rink and replaced all of their ice, so the regular ice, with dry ice instead. And that way, you know, you got some dry ice down here, you know, at one atmosphere, and you jack up the pressure right underneath the ice hockey player skate, and it doesn't melt. It just stays a solid. So the idea is that as you jack up the pressure on a substance, it wants to get more compact. Well, in the case of most substances, if they're already a solid, they're just going to stay a solid. That's typically the most compact phase for the substance. But for water, the, the solid phase, ice, is less dense than the liquid, and so it actually wants to turn into a liquid under that pressure instead. So well, here on the dry ice, you know, uh, it's never going to melt. It's never going to get slippery and stuff like this, and so these ice hockey players aren't going to be able to skate as fast as they're normally used to skating. And um, it kind of be a good prank, you know, to see they just feel slow that day or old or something like that. And it'd be a good prank until they all, you know, died of asphyxiation from CO2 or something like that. But up until that point, it might be funny. Cool, but that is what is unusual about water. You should know that it's all about this solid liquid line of equilibrium having a negative slope. It's due to the fact that ice is less dense than liquid water due to hydrogen bonding. All of that is important all something you're on the hook for. So, but that's ultimately what you need to know about phase diagrams. You should know what a typical compound looks like. You should be able to identify the triple point, the critical point, solid, liquid, gas, all six uh, phase transitions, uh, and then the normal melting point and the normal boiling point. And then you should know what's special about CO2, that one atmosphere lies below the triple point, and what's special about water, again, with that negative slope. Now, if you found this lesson helpful and you want to support the channel, hit that like button. Best thing you can do to make sure that YouTube shows this lesson to other students as well. And if you've got any constructive criticism, leave it in the comment section below. And if you've got destructive criticism, um, well, yeah, leave that in the comment section below as well. Uh, if you are looking for practice for your general chemistry, I've got over 1,200 practice questions in my general chemistry master course. I'll leave a link in the description. A free trial is available. Happy studying.